We know from Scripture that scoffing will only increase as we near the time for Jesus' return. We already see it happening with the blanket acceptance of evolutionary theory. Many people think evolution is a fact, yet they themselves label it a theory. This theory, which remains unproven, excludes our Creator God from the inception of creation. It offers an explanation lacking of divine intervention, leaving the human race to perceive itself as a mere product of chance and natural selection. You and I are not here by chance. That is a lie. God Almighty created you. Moreover, we witness the rapid expansion of false religions that deny the deity of Christ. Religions that reject Jesus as God are growing, spreading doctrines that contradict the core truths of the Bible. These belief systems, while diverse in their tenets, share a common thread. They undermine the foundational Christian belief that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Alongside these developments, there is a significant increase in the number of people identifying as agnostics and atheists. We are living in a time where many scoff at the return of Jesus Christ, mocking and ridiculing the very idea. 2 Peter 3 verse 3 and 4 Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. There is coming a time where every scoffer will have to stand before the one they have scoffed about. There is coming a time where every mocking word and blasphemous comment or utterance will be brought into account. There is coming a time where every scoffer will face the reality they have denied. There is coming a time where the truth of Jesus' deity will be undeniable, where every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is coming a time where every scoffer will see the glory of the Lord shining brighter than the sun and will be confronted with the holiness of God. There is coming a time where every scoffer will tremble in the presence of the Almighty God, the ruler and king of all. There is coming a time where every scoffer will regret their rebellion. There is coming a time where the mercy of God will no longer be extended. There is coming a time where every scoffer will face eternal consequences, where the justice of God will prevail. There is coming a time where every scoffer will understand the weight of their sin and will be confronted with the reality of Gehenna. Despite the prevalence of scoffing and disbelief, we must remember the incredible patience of God. God is tremendously patient with humanity, extending grace and mercy far beyond what we deserve. He delays judgment, giving everyone the opportunity to repent and turn to Him. This patience is a testament to His loving nature, His desire for none to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God's patience is not a sign of weakness, but of His boundless love. He knows the hearts of men and offers countless chances for redemption. However, this patience should not be mistaken for tolerance of sin. Judgment is certain, and the time will come when God will no longer hold back His justice. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. We are living in a time where the Bible describes as the days of evil. I attended a wedding recently with my family, and whilst at this wedding, a man came to know that I was a Christian, and he made it his mission to come explain to me why he was no longer a Christian and why he didn't believe in the concept of Jesus coming. This man went on to tell me about his story, how God never helped him, how if Jesus was going to return, he would have returned back by now. He went on to talk about how free and how liberated he felt no longer prescribing to a Christian life. That was my most memorable interaction with a scoffer because all this man did was attempt to mock Christ's promise of his second return 
by stating that nothing has changed since the world was first created. There is a rise of more and more people who state that Jesus is not coming again. There are even quote-unquote ministers who believe and preach these beliefs. Today, I want to encourage you not to be disheartened by scoffers. Every time you encounter a scoffer, know that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled. Peter told us that this will be happening in the last days. Don't be offended. Don't be surprised or alarmed. Do not be intimidated and do not be swayed by a scoffer. The Bible forewarned us that in the last days, scoffers will be present. This sermon has three points. One, immorality, and two, impatience, and three, the Antichrist spirit. Points one and three will be informational, but point number two, which focuses on impatience, will be a word of encouragement on patience. One, immorality. The last phrase in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, sheds a lot of light on the pursuit of scoffers. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Other versions of this last phrase are New International Version, quote, following their own evil desires. English Standard Version, quote, following their own sinful desires. Amplified Bible, quote, following their own evil desires. Net Bible, quote, being propelled by their own evil urges. Weymouth New Testament, quote, men governed only by their own passions. There is a close connection between their apostasy and their immoral living. The Bible makes it clear that as they scoff, they will follow their sinful desire and immoral lifestyles. This immoral living is generated from their viewpoint. Men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are dark. Point number two, impatience. The problem with scoffers is that they attempt to understand God. But the more and more I walk with the Lord, I have come to understand God is really and truly not a man. God doesn't think the way I think. He does not see the world the way I see the world. He does not operate in the time frames that I operate. He does not operate in the same dimensions that I operate in. He does not operate in the limitations that we operate in. He has no limitations. God is not a man. He dwells in a place of mystery beyond your mind. He dwells in a place of holiness, which we cannot comprehend. He is a consuming fire, and no man has seen God and lives. And once you come to the understanding that we don't approach God based on understanding Him, we approach God based on faith, you will begin to deal with this problem of impatience that we all suffer from. This problem of impatience is a big problem. There are even believers who are impatient with God. Allow me to focus on this problem of believers who are impatient with God. There are a number of believers who secretly are angry at God because God didn't operate on their timetable. And they would never say it out loud that they are angry with God. You would never come out in the open and say it with your mouth that you are angry at God. But in your heart, you are angry at him. But I want to remind you, what God is really concerned about is not the religious slogans that you say with your mouth. No, God is interested with your heart. So many people are secretly mad at God because of their impatience. And this is the observation I made on the man who approached me at this wedding. His scoffing was based on two things, his pursuit of his sinful desires and his anger against God for not operating on his timetable. There are people who hold the notion that God needs to run on my timetable. God isn't moving fast enough. God still hasn't answered my prayers. God hasn't healed me yet. God hasn't given me my breakthrough yet. Do you know, although in the Old Testament, even though Job has a complete book in the Bible that narrates his story, he is only mentioned once in the New Testament? 
42 chapters about him in the Old Testament, but he is only mentioned once in the New Testament. The one and only thing mentioned about Job in the New Testament is not that he was an upright man. It's not that he was faithful to God through all that he went through. It's not the fact he was blameless. The one fact is not that he made a covenant with his eyes. The one fact is not that he feared and eschewed evil. The New Testament focused on one characteristic of Job, and that was patience. James chapter 5, verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. His patience. The only thing mentioned about Job in the New Testament is his patience. Look throughout Scripture, and you will see example after example of people messing up their lives any time they got impatient with God. Want to make a mess of your life? Become impatient with God. Abraham was impatient and couldn't wait for God's promise of a child. The result of his impatience has been a conflict that has spanned the millennia and even at the present moment of history is far from being solved. Look at what Abraham's impatience has caused. The children of Israel were impatient with reaching the Promised Land. From the moment the Israelites left their home in Egypt and headed down to the seashore on their way to the wilderness, they were saturated with impatience. You have probably never heard this, but impatience is another form of unbelief. Because if you did believe in God the way that Job believed in God, you would hold on to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Patience. A mature Christian is a patient Christian. No matter what my situation looks like, I am going to wait on the Lord. Patience. In Bible prophecy and in our personal life, God operates on His timing and not ours. I use this example of how people's impatience with Bible prophecy to show that this issue is an issue of impatience is not only to do with Bible prophecy, it is a general issue of mankind. Everyone wants everything now, and people are starting to see God as Amazon shipping with same-day delivery. And this issue of impatience is getting worse because we live in instant generation, instant coffee, instant delivery, instant rice microwave generation. James chapter 1 verse 3 through 4. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Peter later goes on to tell us the delay of the Lord's coming. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Point number three, Antichrist spirit. A quote scoffer in this context is one who mocks Christ, ridicules the things of God, and opposes the gospel. The purpose of scoffers in the last days will become more intense as the devil will sponsor them as part of his end time strategies to discourage believers from the service of God. Scoffers are stirred up by the Antichrist spirit against those who have chosen to serve God in this. The spirit of Antichrist is the rejection of the deity of Christ. 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. If you have ever encountered anyone who mocks you for your faith in Christ, or tries to argue out that your service to God is in vain, we can describe this person as a scoffer, and they are either knowingly or unknowingly being urged by the spirit of the Antichrist. 
We find ourselves in a generation where some attempt to equate human beings to mere animals. They claim that we are just a part of the animal kingdom, but let me tell you, that could not be farther from the truth. You see, we are made in the image of God. Yes, that's right. The creator of the universe fashioned us in his image, and that sets us apart from all other creatures on this earth. One of the remarkable gifts that God has bestowed upon every single human being is a conscience. It's that inner voice that speaks to us, guiding us toward what is right and warning us against what is wrong. It's a moral compass, a God-given fingerprint in our souls that sets us apart from the rest of creation. And for this reason, among others, we are far more accountable than any other creature on this planet. We are conscious beings, aware of our actions and responsible for our choices. However, my friends, we must confront a sobering reality. We are living in an age, a generation of people with seared consciences. At the very outset of this sermon, I want you to grasp the gravity of this truth. We are living in an age where the moral compass within many hearts has been cauterized, rendered insensitive to the still small voice of God. But that's not all. I also heard of a young lady who entered into the covenant of marriage, pledging her heart and faithfulness to her spouse. And what did she do? She engaged in an affair with her former love, all the while she was engaged and even after they were wed. A generation of seared consciences, my friends, where sacred vows are discarded like yesterday's news and the sanctity of marriage is trampled upon without remorse. In this age of seared consciences, we witness a world that often rejects the very values and principles that have been the bedrock of human civilization for centuries. It's a world where truth is twisted, where right is called wrong, and wrong is called right. But as believers, we must stand firm in our conviction that our consciences have not been seared, and we must not conform to the patterns of this world. Instead, let us seek to renew our minds and hearts daily through the Word of God, allowing His truth to guide our actions and decisions. Let us be the beacon of light in this dark world, exemplifying the love, grace, and righteousness of our Creator. My friends, in this age of seared consciences, we are called to be the salt and light of the earth, to be the ones who speak the truth in love, and to hold fast to our moral compass even when the world around us seems adrift in moral relativism. Let us not be discouraged, but rather inspired to be a generation that stands for what is right, just, and holy. The human conscience is something we should not take lightly. The human memory is also something we should not take lightly. But before we talk about the human conscience in more detail, allow me to take a small detour and talk about the human memory. One thing that I have seen a lot of people struggle with is the memories of the sins they committed in the past. Decades have passed by, but they are still haunted by the memories of their sins. This is another reason why you should avoid sin. The memory of sins we have committed can sometimes come back and flash themselves before your eyes. You could be having a moment of joy with your family, and then a memory of sin you committed years ago, a sin that God has already forgiven you for, comes into your memory, and it just ruins your day. Someone once said, let the dead bury the dead. But that is one thing that does not die. Memories. Memories do not die. Do you know even death does not wipe your memory away? Even hell does not free you from your memory. We see this in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man in the story had all his senses. He could feel, he could see, he could talk, and he could think. Luke 16 verse 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, 
Son, remember. But son, remember. But son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Even in hell a person's memory will not leave them. Therefore we should be careful. Even in hell people right now have their memories, the memory of their life, the memory of all the sins they committed, the memory of all the times they rejected salvation. The human memory will live on. That is why we should be so careful about the way we live our lives. Now let's get back to talk about the human conscience. Some shall depart from the faith, resulting in people having a seared conscience. We all were born with a conscience. We know right from wrong. God created us in a way in which that even if we had never heard of the gospel, we know that murder is wrong, stealing is wrong, sexual immorality is wrong. But the truth is, people are beginning to change. The conscience that God created us with is being seared. And you see it in churches, and you see it in the world, people are beginning to change. And this is one of Satan's last day's strategies. The devil is trying to infiltrate the conscience of people. The devil wants people to keep committing the same sin over and over again until their conscience becomes dead, until their conscience becomes accustomed to it. The devil wants to have people going back to their sin repeatedly until their life is adjusted to that pattern of living. There are many people in our day who commit grievous sins but will never show any sign of remorse for them. It is because their conscience is seared. But let's not talk about the world. Let's talk about those who are departing from the faith. Over the past decade, so many scandals are coming into the light. These scandals involve influential pastors in the Christian community involved in immoral activity, and some of them have been involved in these activities for years, for decades. Why is this? A seared conscience. If you still have your heart judging you over sin any time you fall, it is because you still have your conscience alive. The activeness of our conscience is determined by the level of our submission to its judgment and corrections. If your conscience judges you about certain misconduct and you quickly repent and ask God for mercy, your consciousness and sensitivity to sin will be enhanced. But the more rebellious you are to the voice of your conscience, the more weakened it will grow. A persistent rebellion to the voice of your conscience will lead to a seared conscience. But how can I tell that my consciousness is being seared? How can I tell if I am changing? The answer is simple. Examine your life. Is there a sin you are committing that you are now accustomed to? Compare your reaction to the first time you committed that sin to now. For most people, the first time you committed that sin, you were so upset that you committed that sin. You were heartbroken that you committed that sin. You were convicted by the Holy Spirit about that sin. You were overwhelmed by a godly sorrow. But now, when you commit that sin, it does not faze you anymore. You committing that sin now is like water off a duck's back. You committing that sin is now like a fish in water. You committing that sin now is like a pig in mud. Then you are changing. 
your conscience is slowly being seared. The enemy and sin are slowly but surely working on the destruction of your conscience. In your life right now, think, think, think. Is there a sin that you use to hate committing? It would affect you so much each time you committed that sin and now it doesn't bother you anymore. Now that sin has become your second nature. You are no longer remorseful about the sin. You don't even feel bad about it anymore. Your consciousness is being seared. The devil is ready at all costs to destroy the conscience of humanity and especially in these last days he is really working hard at it. Haven't you seen how the world glamorizes sexual immorality, fornication and adultery? The devil wants to portray these things as normal, but the Bible tells us to clearly flee from sexual immorality. Sin always grows. It always progresses. It starts as something small. It starts with looking at unholy videos on the internet. Then it progresses into lust. Then it progresses into fornication. Then it progresses to adultery. Stage after stage, sin pulls you deeper, destroying your conscience. Once Satan has a stronghold in someone's life, he won't just stay there. He will go to another area and then another. One sin will introduce you to another. Never get comfortable with sin. Satan never puts all his eggs in one basket. He is too smart to do that. Once Satan gets one stronghold, he will go and grab another, and then another. Strongholds and Places for the Devil 2 Corinthians 10, 3, 6 For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing unto captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled, Strongholds are defensive structures that protect people or something from attack or defeat. The Bible talks about the name of the Lord being a strong tower into which the righteous runs and is safe. There are also strongholds of darkness, which gives the devil an advantage over people's lives. These strongholds of Satan are the focus of today's message. There are several ways the devil tries to build strongholds in people's lives. Strongholds are real, and this is an area in the Bible that the church does not speak enough about. Strongholds are real. I have struggled with them in my own life, and I am sure you have too. And the worst thing about strongholds is that they grow. They always grow. Strongholds grow. They are like roots. Have you ever seen a root take shape and form in people's lives? Roots dig down deep. Roots go into the ground and tangle. Roots embedded into the soil. And that is exactly what strongholds do. One stronghold gives birth to another, and then another stronghold, and then another stronghold. A perfect example is the sin of fornication. A person begins with a problem of lust, and then lust leads to another stronghold the stronghold of watching pornography, and then the person begins to fornicate and refuses to exercise self-control and discipline their flesh, and fornication becomes a stronghold in their life. Fornication becomes a real stronghold in their life. Years pass as they continue to fornicate, and that stronghold of fornication continues to grow and grow. That root of fornication continues to get deeper and deeper, and then eventually they get married, and the stronghold of fornication becomes adultery. Don't lie to yourself and think once you get married, you will be able to stop bed hopping. You don't magically get self-control from entering marriage. 
Now, the stronghold of fornication creates another stronghold of adultery. And the stronghold of adultery creates another stronghold, the stronghold of lies and deception. Because to commit adultery, you have to hide it. So the person starts lying about their whereabouts, who they are with, where they are going, who they are texting. Do you see how one stronghold creates other strongholds? From lust to pornography, to fornication to adultery, to lies and deception. One stronghold opens the door to other strongholds. And we know no one is perfect, but it is important to be honest with yourself. What strongholds do you have in your life? 1 John 1 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Be honest with yourself and review your life. I am not saying stand up on the rooftop and declare to everyone I have a problem with alcohol, or I have a problem with lying, or I have a problem with adultery or porn, or I have a problem with stealing. No, you don't have to declare it to the world, but be honest with yourself and examine your life and acknowledge that you have a problem in this area, and then go to God. Put that area forward to Him. Ultimately, salvation is not between you and your wife. Salvation is not your relationship with you and the local pastor. No, salvation is your relationship with God. Approach the throne of God. Ask for Him to help you with the stronghold in your life. Don't protect strongholds for the devil. Don't accept a stronghold of sin in your life. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18 reads, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart.